Hey, this is Johnny Jett, and this is my 39 Travel Questions podcast, also YouTube channel. So if you're not a member of either, please sign up. And today we're honored to have Joseph Rosendo, who is a four-time Emmy Award-winning director and host. And you've probably seen the show before if you ever watched PBS, and I hope you have. Um, it airs all throughout uh, the U.S., Canada. It's called Travel Scope. It's actually the official name is Joseph Rosendo's Travel Scope. And, um, you know, Joseph has been around longer than I have. And he started in 1980. And since then, he's and the show started in 2007. Is that correct? That's right. The show actually started airing a little bit before that on a station in San Antonio. A PBS station in about 2005, but it, it went national in uh, 2007. Well, and it's been, uh, we're in our 12th season. If we can get it done, we'll, be out, we'll have 12 seasons. Congratulations. We'll and I, yeah. Actually, I just interviewed Mark Walters, who was right before you. And I always ask people, you know, who do you like? What's your favorite TV travel show? And sure enough, he said, travel, Joseph Rosendo's Travel Scope. And um, so I know you're very popular and uh, it's just That's great very to nice have you Yeah, I appreciate that. That's terrific. Yeah. So um, let's get started. Let's do it. I know where you were born, but where, where did you grow up? I grew up in Miami, in Miami, Florida. I was, uh, I was there until I was in my 20s. I went to school at Florida State University uh, and I got my degree in speech and theater at that time because I was an actor and that was my goal and I, then I came to UCLA for my graduate work and I did I did my graduate two years of graduate school at UCLA in a very performance oriented uh, program it, we were acting and directing and uh, do, doing all of the uh, tech work uh, as a little production company it was really a tremendous opportunity and that's really funny enough how I became a travel writer because um, in my second year as a graduate student there going for my MFA, um, I was cast in a show, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, which was very uh, big hit back then. And, but it was a show that was going to become a USO tour to Europe. And that experience, the performance was wondering, wonderful in serving the, our, our, our men who were uh, fighting and all, many of them at that time on the way to Vietnam because this was in 1969. But being in Europe and the opportunity we had at the end of the tour to travel throughout Europe somewhat really turned me on to travel. That was my first experience outside of the country. I was 23 years old, completely changed my life and had put, pushed me in the direction of becoming a travel writer and a travel radio host and now a television host and director and a writer. Yeah, I watched your Emmy acceptance speech on your website. Uh, oh, thanks. Morning. It's great. I mean, what an honor. Amazing. It was uh, a wonderful evening. It was a wonderful evening. You know, it's, we've been nominated, uh, Julie 19, would know the exact numbers. But, 19 times. Well, there you go. You know the exact numbers. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we've been nominated 19 times. We've won six. Six times. So it's won six, and I've won four of those. And that's a, it's tremendous to win, I can tell you. No matter what they say, nom being nominated is great. But winning is a lot greater. I mean, I mean, I mean that's, my, that's my ultimate goal. And I just said it right now. But, I mean, you made it. I mean, you should just, you're done. You've done it. I mean, what? there's not much more you can do. Well, I hope I'll find something else to do. I expect to be around for a while. Well, we hope so. But, I mean, to win an Emmy is just amazing. Well, thank you so much. That's so, great. And, you know, well, we have, not to plug the show too much, but we have our, uh, we have about 50 telly awards that we won. And that's a, a industry award that goes out to uh, the best of, of different kinds of, of shows and different kind in different areas. So we won 50 of those. So that's pretty amazing. It is. And speaking of your show, so it's on PBS, but you can also find it on Amazon. Yes. Yes. People can stream it on Amazon. It's uh, internationally distributed. So people, we have, we have viewers in Spain. We get, 
emails from regularly and in other places around the world. As you mentioned at the beginning of the show, I appreciate that, that we do air in Canada because quite, we have many of our viewers are in Canada, but other places too. So yes, uh, they can get it on Amazon and, uh, and that's a good way for them to, to see the show. Uh, my wife's Canadian, by the way, so I never forget about my Canucks. Lucky gal, lucky gal, <laughs> love the Canadians. Some of the, some of the most friendliest people in the world and some of the most uh, really uh, decent people in the world yeah. too. I really love Canadians. Actually, that is one of my questions that I might as well just ask you now is, uh, where do you think the friendliest people in the world are? Well, you know, my background is Cuban and I've had the opportunity to, uh, the only one from my family actually, to go back to Cuba six times. And I would say the Cubans are some of the most friendly people in the world. Uh, in, in, in close, to, close to them are uh, the Mexicans. I've done a lot in Mexico, a lot of shows, a lot of radio shows. And the Mexican people are warm, open-hearted people. Uh, so the, the Cubans are amazing and a lot of fun to be with as well. We just were in Cuba, Julie and I, um, beginning of last year. And um, we had a, a wonderful, oh, no, it was this year, that's right, before all of this happened in January. And we had a fabulous uh, time in Pernar de Rio, which is the birthplace of my, my grandfather, who that's where he came from. And uh, these people treated us as if we were family, and I felt like I was at home there. That's, that's great. And were you born in Cuba? I was not. I was born in Miami, so I'm second generation American. But my grandparents on both sides were born in Cuba. And in fact, my, well, my grandfathers they were born in Cuba when it was a part of Spain. They came over after the Cuban War of Independence called here in the United States the Spanish-American War, of course. Uh, and they came over and um, they, they, they made a life here. So they, they were born in Cuba. Okay. Well, one of my favorite foods is Cuban. Is it one of yours? Uh, well, it sure is. I, we do a special Noche Buena Christmas Eve uh, feast that is uh, pork and yuca and black beans and rice. And uh, I do it from scratch, invite a few of my friends. And it's, uh, it's, quite, a, it's quite, a, quite, a, quite a event. But, you know, but that was when I grew up with that, my grandparents would do it at, their, at, their, um, at the little, little cigar factory my grandfather uh, built in, in Miami. And uh, it, we, it would be a feast and a party uh, that, that I still remember is very fondly. My three-year-old loves, my three-year-old, first of all, is a very picky eater, like I used to be and still can be, but um, he loves rice and beans and plantains. So whenever we see a Cuban place, we try and stop and grab all that. He loves it. Yeah, uh, well, I, I love Cuban food. Uh, I love lots of different kinds of foods in there. And Cuban food is very straightforward. Uh, it's normally, uh, you know, it's not, um, uh, it is truly uh, uh, the food of the people uh, that, that we know is Cuban food. Some people have managed to make it a gourmet. I try, do my best at that. But it's really a very simple, straightforward food based on what was available to the people on the islands. And it continues to be available to them. Yeah, so I got two questions. Usually I ask people what, what their favorite restaurant is, but first I'm going to ask you what your favorite Cuban restaurant is in L.A. since you live in L.A. and, um, and then what's your favorite restaurant in the world? Well, the, the, Versailles has a tremendous reputation here in, in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, uh, but, but really to get Cuban food in Los Angeles, I go to Porto's. I get a Cuban sandwich there and I get a number of... In Burbank? In Burbank is the one I go to. There's yeah. also one in, in Glendale. Gotcha. But um, I love the the pasteles, you know, the guava and cheese uh, pastries. Yeah, I've had that. That was a famous thing from when I'm, from my life in Miami. I, I also love the Cuban sandwiches, and I get uh, the crackers, the Cuban crackers. We they we, we like they taste kind of like dust, but they're addictive. I mean, we, Julie and I, between ourselves, call them dust crackers because they are very, very, very extremely dry, uh, but they're, they're addictive. And so I always get a bag of those. I get a couple of cheese, uh, cheese and guava um, uh, delicacies and pastries, and then I get a Cuban sandwich to take home. And for my Noche Buena feast, I always get their Cuban bread. But when you don't get their French bread, what they call kind of like their baguette French bread, get their Cuban, what they call uh, pounders, 
and those that they do the most traditional Cuban bread that I've tasted in Los Angeles. Wow, well, I'm going to I'm going to go back to this video and watch it and we're going to go and hit both those places and order that stuff. And so but what is your favorite restaurant by the way in the world if you could pick one? Well, you know, that's a hard hard uh, question because I've had the for good fortune through my many years of being a travel writer to to eat some of the most fantastic meals and on a one-time basis i could say many 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 places and but i think a favorite restaurant i mean i thought about that question a favorite restaurant is a place you go back to a lot and whenever you have an opportunity to go there whenever you're in the city or whenever you're uh, you go back yeah. uh, certainly here in topanga where i live i have my favorites the end of the seventh ray, I would highly recommend to anybody coming here in Southern California. It's a beautiful experience, uh, all organic, a wonderful food. You couldn't pick a better setting and it fits now for our outdoor dining. It's completely outdoor, Good. beautiful lighting right on the creek here in Topanga ah, in the spring. Uh, or the early summer when there's still water in the creek. It is amazing experience. Uh, so that's my favorite here in, in Los Angeles. I mean, here in, in, in my local town. Right. But in there is a, you know, so when I think about the favorite places around the world, there is a place at the Algier Market in Paris, just around a corner from the market. And every time I go to Paris, I, use, I went originally to go to the market which would be my best tip for people on finding great restaurants. I go to the markets. The markets often have some of the greatest restaurants in the world. There's the Capuchin market uh, in, in Bordeaux that has the most fantastic oysters you can get anywhere. And they're like a dollar, you know, and you know, fr people think France, uh, fr France is expensive. It's not if you know where you go. So it's about a buck. And the same thing with this little market, this little place is called the, uh, it's called the Pesh or Sea Bass, I believe with the name of the, no, that's not the name of it. Let me think, I actually wrote it down. You, you know what, I'm gonna write a blog post about this and I'm gonna send you the, um, I'm gonna send it to you before I publish it and you can um, send me the answer. Yeah, and yeah, that sure. Way, that way people will have all the correct spellings and all that stuff, so. That'll be great, that'll be great. Yeah, uh, and, and you can it, even it, add what other restaurants you want to. Oh, it's called a sea bar. Ah, I just remembered. Sea bar Paris Pesh is the whole name. And it's just a little place around the corner from the market, right up from the Algier market in the Bastille uh, arrondissement. And, um, and I can get a glass of Sancerre, six oysters, and it's like 10 euros. Wow. That's so awesome. the value and the oysters are from Brittany, so they're the freshest and the best. And a glass of Sam Sarah. I mean, how do you beat a glass of Sam Sarah? <laughs> so, which is, you know, a Sauvignon Blanc from the Loire region of France, my favorite white wine. But that's, that's, so I get everything I love. Oyster is my favorite food. Paris is one of my favorite uh, cities. And being on, a, being in, in close proximity to a market is one of my favorite experiences. Okay. Well, my last food question before I'll get back to like the basics, um, sure. what's the craziest thing you've ever eaten? Oh, good question. Uh, in, um, in Taiwan, which we've done a number of shows in Taiwan, when I first went to Taiwan, I was wondering, okay, uh, we'll cover Taipei and the, the Taipei 101, the biggest yep. uh, building in the world at that time. And then what else am I going to do here? Uh, I, we've, we've found so much to do in Taiwan that we've done 10 shows. And uh, one of the most interesting experiences is when I went out to the islands of the island of Taiwan. And they have a number of islands that are wonderful destinations. And we went out to uh, this island called Orchid Island, uh, just off the coast, the eastern coast of Taiwan. And they have a, a, one of the 14 indigenous people of uh, indigenous or um, the people of Taiwan, uh, one of the groups and one of the most vital groups from all the 14 and the, the Tao people. And one of their traditions is a flying fish tradition. And each of the villages on the island are given a certain time of the year when they're able to pick, uh, to be out and go fishing. And it's really very heavily regulated within the, the people and the tribe. And what we were had the good fortune, very rare, 
to be able to go out and, and, and experience a, uh, a flying fish uh, night. They thought that we ended up being honored guests because they had a wonderful night catching flying fish and they said we brought them luck. So they took us back to their town and they allowed us to watch them fillet the fish. This is all kind of very sacred stuff, how they cut it, how they, they serve the fish. And then they offered me fish sperm. Fish. Sperm, yes, which was a delicacy. <laughs> and of course I couldn't say no. And actually it wasn't horrible, but uh, it wasn't be something that I want to have again. But that was uh, really, uh, they probably one of the most unusual things I've ever had was fish sperm, flying fish sperm. They also offered me uh, flying fish eyeballs, which um, I was not able to get down. Uh, although all the little kids from the village, when they were watching the things being, the, the fish being uh, uh, cut up, were just waiting for me to get, get out of the way so they could get those eyeballs. Wow. But, uh, that was the one thing I couldn't I eat. think you might, you might now be the winner with that answer, so. Yeah, please, <laughs> yeah, talk, well, you, you asked. <laughs> So how many countries do you think you've been to? I know how many countries I've been to. There is an app called Ben, B-E-E-N, yep. that I have on my phone. And I've been, I've been to 93 countries. Wow. But the, but the depressing thing, Johnny, is that that's only 38% of the world. I've been to 93 countries. 93 is more, it's more than, it's, it's, no, a, it's 193 my, countries, 196. According or, to my app. It says it's only 38%. No, 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 no. No, that's wrong? Good. I'm glad to hear it. According to the UN, it's either 190, 192, 193, or 196. It all depends. I think oh, it's okay. 192. Good. I think I'm it's 192. Better, I'm in a much better situation. I'm about 50% of the world. Yeah. I still have another half of the world to uh, visit. Okay. Right. Um, a I, lot. You know, but so that, that's, that's that, you know, and I've had, uh, I've done a lot of Europe, of course. And, uh, but I've also had the good fortune to be able to travel in Asia quite a bit and in Africa, which is a tremendous opportunity to travel in Africa. Antarctica? And Antarctica is the only continent I haven't set foot on. Now I got pretty close. I was on an Australia's uh, cruise that took me around Cape Horn. So mm -hmm. I could kind of see uh, Antarctica there, uh, but they didn't take us over and drop us off. And, but the experience of going around Cape Horn was amazing. Amazing. absolutely amazing and we they were it was very iffy or whether or not we're going to be able to do it or not because of the you know it's always it's one of the roughest waters in the world and I, what we did it was great i bet um it's one reason why i have not been to antarctica um and that's the only continent i haven't been to either so uh what's your uh what's your earliest travel memory my earliest travel memory this is pretty important uh because um when my parents, every, every year, my father uh, was, uh, he was a laborer. He, he worked uh, on many odd jobs. Uh, you know, he grew up um, during the depression. Uh, so he, he had like a sixth grade education. So he had to work as many jobs as he could to support his four kids. And every year uh, he, he, he got a job working as a custodian and they would give a week off, you know, the great American week off. And he would, every year go back to his hometown of Key West, which is about 150 miles from Miami, and visit his family. And that would be the trip. It started out just being a day trip. He'd drive all the way down to Key West. He'd run around, meet his, he'd see his family. We'd take a dip or two, uh, jump off of the southernmost bridge in the world, and then, uh, he, and then we'd head back to Miami. Well, finally we, got, we were able to stay, eventually we were able to stay on overnight. But this, this really got me, made me fall in love with travel. Every, we'd get up early in the morning before the sun came up because we were in Miami and my father wanted to beat the heat. And when you're in Miami in the summer, you're doing everything to beat the heat and the humidity. So, so I would lie, I, I don't know if I ever slept on one of those trips because I'd stay awake waiting for the alarm to go off at like five, uh, 5.30. In fact, one year I crawled out of my bed, went over to their bed in the other room and turned the alarm back to 4.30 <laughs> so that the trip would start earlier. And it's, it's, it's actually a story I wrote that's in uh, a, a new book that I'll be coming out with called Musings, uh, the short 
happy pursuit of pleasure in other journeys. And I, I mentioned it in the book because it's very significant in my life, those trips. That's when I fell in love with travel. I understood the value of escape, the escape. And it was an escape for us. And the family was, you know, it was a joyous time uh, for us. And that was, that was uh, important in my family to have those joyous times. And then the other one was the USO show, uh, you know, tw uh, probably 16, 17 years later when I um, went with the USO show to Germany. And that, that was the other most significant travel experience in my life. Wow. Um, speaking of travel, how are you doing with the quarantine? Would you get on a plane tomorrow? Already been on a plane. Oh, good. Uh, when we went up to visit uh, uh, our, uh, my, my stepson and my daughter-in-law in Los Gatos, California, uh, for, uh, some, for some health reasons, we were there. Uh, Julie was there for three weeks. I was there for a week, and I flew back um, aboard Southwest from uh, San, San Jose. And it was a very interesting experience. Um, we also had reservations to go to France. We had a whole trip to France, uh, one of my favorite places in the world, to uh, spend a month in France. And, um, and we held on to those tickets for as long as we could. But as you know, uh, because of the pandemic here in the United States and, and the unfortunate way it's been handled here in the United States, we're not allowed to go to Europe. The EU won't allow us in. And I just heard recently that uh, Bahamas, which had opened to Americans, have now about to shut shut the door to Americans again because they had a, a major spike yep. of, of cases. So, uh, so anyway, that's 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 you know that's so that stopped as we we're in the middle of uh, on, we we're in fact at the airport on the way to go to Ireland to cover St. Patrick's Day uh, when um, announcement was made that um, no American, no foreign planes would be allowed back into the United States. That announcement was eventually changed shortly thereafter to allow Americans coming back on a right. foreign plane. But, but unfortunately, when that announcement was made, all plans for our trip was canceled. We've had five shoots that we've had to cancel or postpone until next year. So we're in that, but it did, the, the virus did give me an opportunity to, to um, put a book together that I've been working on for 20 years. This book that I just mentioned, Musings, The Short Happy Pursuit of Pleasure and Other Journeys. And that should be coming out this summer. And, and that is, uh, you know, I've, I, at least we've had the opportunity to make a good time, uh, make good use of the time I have. And, and my wife, Julie, and I have had some fabulous meals on our deck here in Topanga. Uh, you know, my, my cooking skills have gotten better, and we've done a lot of uh, Zoom meetings with relatives and friends. So it's, it's been a very, very interesting time. Okay. So it hasn't been all negative. Of course, there's, uh, we feel our heart goes out to all the people who have suffered disastrous from this pandemic, people who's lost their lives. Uh, I, think, I think we're up to over 150,000 here in the United States or more almost a million people, half a million worldwide. Yeah. Uh, it's been a, a, a major uh, a event in all of our lives and I think in the world's history. Yeah, and did you get COVID, or you your wife? No, we did not. We've been very, very, we've, and we've been tested twice. We're, I'm over 65 and uh, Julie's not quite, uh, but she, uh, she, she is of an age where she needs to be tested too. And we've been tested twice and both times proved negative. Um, we, uh, we're fortunate that we don't have a personal uh, relation. We don't have a family that have, have had a problem. Uh, we don't know of people who have had, uh, had the illness. Uh, for, thank God, no one that's lost their life yet. Mm -hmm. But so many people have suffered with this. It's a, for sure. it's a major event that need, need to, needed to have been taken seriously from the very beginning. And I think we'd be in better shape in the United States. Without a doubt. I mean, the problem with the masks right now and not people taking that seriously, making it political, I just don't see it getting better. I, I really don't it's for a really while. It's really a shame. It's really a shame that some people would use this, this tragedy, this, this, this crisis in the world for their own benefit. Yeah. It is really a shame. Yeah, it's dividing people. My uncle died of COVID, by the way. I've had two friends on ventilators, 
I've had multiple friends, and including my sister had it not too long ago, Sorry. and my nephew. So, I mean, I know a lot of people who've had it. Wow. Um, and, um, but. You're, you know, you know, it's time to be serious. Oh, I knew from day one, I was supposed to do a trip around the world in February. And I, and I, uh, I had, I canceled it when I had CEOs or, or, or executives of Asian airlines telling me, do not come. And I was like, wow, if they're telling me not to come. This is for real. Yeah, it was, um, for, it was for real. And some of us, you know, so it, 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 I mean, I don't mind people. I really don't mind the fact that people maybe at the beginning uh, didn't really understand how dangerous it was. Right. But now that it's so obvious for people to act like it does not exist right. or to make hay while the sun shines, so to speak, or doesn't shine, of this event is really a tragedy totally. and we really it's really done a lot to hurt our uh, prestige in the world 100 percent. it's it's really sad um really sad. but speaking of the world and the united states what's your favorite city in america and internationally if you can pick one internationally oh, city favorite city oh well, i have to, you know in the united states um well, I, you know, like everyone, um, I love New York, but I live in LA. So those are two cities that are my favorite once again. And, and I've, I've written about that. I've written about uh, my experience, what LA is about because I know LA in many people's minds or Los Angeles, as we call it out here. Uh, they, they, it gets a lot of negative press, but uh, Los Angeles is one of the great cities of the world. And uh, of course, New York is obvious and has been for many, many years. Uh, the other city that I, I, I really love, by the way, and it's for many reasons, is San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I, I, uh, and I'm so happy that they have taken this pandemic seriously too. Of, of the towns in Texas, they have been the opposite of many of the places in Texas. Uh, but that, that's a city that really has a lot of soul. It has gigantic diversity. Uh, the, uh, the Mexican population there gives a lot of, 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 of weight and, and diversity to the, it really makes that town special. I met my wife there. So of course it's very special to me. Is Julie and, from San Antonio? Julie is not from San Antonio, but she lived there for, she lived in Texas for over 30 years, uh, and she was in San Antonio for a long time. And I met her when I was doing a radio broadcast, a remote broadcast, covering a wine tasting event uh, that her PBS station that she worked for, KLRN, was handling. And I met her. She was my, the guest on the show. She was running the event. And, uh, uh, you know, the rest is history. Uh, I gave her a, a sample of this idea i had to do a television show and i put a video together it was kind of a sample of it and uh she got it and she didn't look at it <laughs> but uh, when she came out to los angeles for her daughter's graduation her son and her daughter were both living here in los angeles we all went out to dinner and i gave her another dvd and uh and then we uh our personal relationship started after that and she of course you know is the producer uh, the executive producer of, of Travelscope uh, jo and Joseph Rosendo's Travelscope. And uh, really, without her, there would be no Joseph Rosendo's Travelscope. Well, we're going to have to have her on sometime oh, and do, a do 39 do, questions do. with her. And I actually watched one of your episodes. I don't know how many times you filmed in San Antonio, but I've watched one episode of you filming in San Antonio. You're both on the boat going down the uh, canal or is it the river there. Well, the funny thing is that when I first came across country to go to UCLA for my graduate work, I stopped in San Antonio back then in 19, uh, what year was that? That was uh, 1968. So that was my first experience. And I, I, I liked the town then. And I wasn't a travel writer. I was a, an actor. And, uh, and then I, when I did the radio show, I did many shows on San Antonio. And then we have a general show on San Antonio. We have a Christmas show on San Antonio. We have a fiesta show on San Antonio, all on Joseph Rosendo's travel scope. And wow. uh, yeah, and and I, I uh, and my meeting my wife there was was the most important thing that happened with my relationship with San Antonio. But it's a fabulous town for sure. How about internationally? What's your favorite city? Oh 
well, you know, there's so many, once again, wonderful places. I, I love France, so there are many places in France that are favorite to me. Uh, f funny enough, uh, I love Toulouse uh, in the south of France. It's, uh, um, it's, it's uh, uh, once again, a very diverse city and uh, a, a, a university town, has a lot of life and, and uh, vivacity to it. So that's one of my, my favorite places. I've spent uh, quite a bit of time in Paris and who doesn't like Paris? I mean, that's, <laughs> for me to say Paris is one of my favorite cities is kind of like, oh, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, but I've, uh, I, yeah, it, and it's, it's funny when I, some of the cities that you would not think, and I never thought would be my favorites, like Taipei in Taiwan, ended up becoming a favorite city. And it, there's so much in that, in that town, and it's a tremendous introduction to the rest of the island. But, you know, I, I, there's so many wonderful places. Cartagena in Colombia is fabulous. Uh, we, uh, we, we spent, my wife and I spent a vacation there, one of the few vacations we've had. So that, that, so that, that would be another one that I, I would go back to in a shot. And in many places, uh, you know, San, uh, uh, the, the town, so many times in, in Mexico as well, I've, uh, I've, I've, I, I love uh, Allende. Uh, the town. It sounds like you love everywhere you go, which is a great quality. I got cued from off, off camera here by my producer wife, still producing, <laughs> even producing our interview. <laughs> uh, how about she what's her in here, but she doesn't think that she, uh, she doesn't think she's ready for prime time. Uh, you know, I, 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 my wife's the same way. Uh, what country do you think has the meanest immigration officers? What country? Well, I think the U.S. has some of the meanest, uh, and they've become meaner, unfortunately. Uh, I, you know, I've, of all the places, I normally don't have any trouble with people, and and uh, and that's not the way I travel. I travel, you go with the flow, and you take everything in with a grain of salt, and and everybody's got their own problems. Uh, coming in from Canada, I, I ran into some of the meanest U.S. immigration people I've ever had met into, and they were really uh, kind of uh, unusually uh, doing their job and usually strict. But, you know, everybody's got their thing. Yeah, uh, yeah Israel, uh, some people might say, has mean immigration people. I don't think that they're mean. I just think they're extremely vigilant and suspicious and watchful. And that can be translated as meanness. And I, perhaps that is what was happening with the U.S. immigration officers that I, I met with. Right. But, you know, the truth is that's just a, a very small, of all the places I've traveled, mostly people have, have done their job. They've done their job well. And it's hard for me to say that any of them are really mean. They were overworked and probably stressed out of it. Gotcha. And do you have a favorite U.S. airport and international airport? Well, Los Angeles better be my favorite airport because <laughs> I go out of it all the time. It's, and it's gotten better. It's gotten better. You know, I've been in Los Angeles since 1968, and I've been a traveler since a travel writer since 1980. So I've watched the evolution of Los Angeles International Airport, and I think they have. It's it's a wonderful place to travel into. I mean, I agree. Uh, you know, and they've made they've done what they can to make it easier to get in and get out. Um, and, and as far as what they offer there, it's equal to any international airport. Uh, one of my favorite restaurants in the world, James Beach, which is uh, at the end of Le uh, Venice Boulevard in, in Venice, one of my favorite places in the world. They have an outlet in Los Angeles International Airport. And I, that, that was like a really high point to find them there. But uh, it, it, so that so I would be that would be uh, my favorite uh, U.S. airport, and um, in in the airport in Taipei, and uh, the Diva Air uh, business class lounge is spectacular, and once again uh, the the offerings at um, the Taipei airport in um, in Taiwan are, are extraordinary. I mean anything you ever need for anything. I mean, I can find Cuban cigars there. Uh, so, uh, and that's important for, to me. Uh, so, yeah, so, so I would say, I would say and Taipei off the top of my head and, um, and LAX. Yeah, I love the Taipei airport. 
especially when you see all the Hello Kitty stuff. It's it's yeah, it's yeah, pretty it's, fun. It's, right, it's great. And yeah. um, we've got you know yeah we've we've purchased all our gifts for home in in the, at, oftentimes at the airport. Um, speaking of planes, ever sat next to any famous celebrities going out of LAX? You must have. Well, you would think I was once on it, but I not as not I haven't sat next to them maybe because they were in first class, <laughs> and I wasn't. But I did. Uh, I was on a plane with Oliver Stone. And it was uh, interesting to uh, hear him. And in fact, the plane was delayed. And it was interesting to watch him go up and ask the stewardess, because he had to get back to LA. And we had to stay, we were on the ground for like five hours. It was a snowstorm. In New York or? He was very measured. He asked, he basically was asking to get off the plane. So he, because he had to get back to LA. And they told him that he could not. And he kind of sucked it up and went and sat back in his first class seat. Wow. So, um, so. Uh, I assume was, that was from New York. It was. It was from New York. I exactly. gotcha. That's where York. you find. I, mean, I, I, used to, I used to do LA New York every other weekend. And I would see, I mean, everybody. Oh, actually, Ju Julia has just cued me. It was in, from Heathrow. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it was from Heathrow. We were coming back from Heathrow. That is surprising. And we were also there in business. So, see, I'm getting a. <laughs> you're going to enjoy talking to her because I will not be in the background queuing her. Because I got the out. fact checker right here. I thought um, I I beg to differ. Actually, I think. <laughs> right. Okay, go ahead. How about um? Do you have a favorite hotel? Oh, gosh, I do. I do have a favorite hotel, and I've been in some of the most spectacular hotels in the world. Le, the La Saint or the Saint Hotel in Paris is fantastic, wonderful, uh, beautiful location uh, over in, uh, on, on the Saint Germain or near Saint Germain. Uh, but uh, the two that really stick out, and I thought about this too, uh, is, you know what's important to me is a hotel can be luxurious. I'm worried about being in a hotel and not knowing that I'm in a foreign country. So I don't want to be in a hotel a that separates me from the country uh, and, and, and gives me my American, uh, you know, what they consider to be my American comfort level. I don't want that. I want to experience the culture even in the hotel. The Hotel Tugu on uh, Kangu Beach in Bali does that in spades. It is really something I recommend to people. You have a cultural experience when you walk in the door. It is practically an archeological museum, first mm -hmm. of all. They have some pieces of artwork there from Bali that are a thousand years old. It is amazing what the owners of that hotel have done. They include in any stay uh, cultural activities like a whole performance at night a culture, which including a cultural, a meal that is uh, particularly uh, Balinese. They, um, they have uh, mas even their massages, even their spas specialize in Balinese style. The music is Balinese. This is, you walk into that hotel, if you never left the hotel, you would feel you were in Bali and you would have a pretty authentic experience. Wow. That's, that's amazing. And besides the fact that they're only about 50 feet from Kangu Beach, which is also kind of nice. Uh, that hotel, and then in Taipei, there is a hotel in the Hakka uh, area of Taiwan, another, um, not an indigenous group. The Hakka people are not an indigenous group. They're a Chinese uh, culture, uh, but they are from a specific part of, Thai, of, of China. Uh, and are different than the Han Chinese, which settled most of Thai, Taiwan. And there is a town called Sanji, where it's, it's a center of Hakka culture, Hakka food, Hakka art, Hakka history. And there's a place called the Joy House in Sanji, where you, uh, it's built, it's a hotel, uh, the cottages they are, built within like a little village. So you're, you're like within little Hakka village. And there are activities you go, you get to do indigo dyeing there, uh, cloth dyeing, you get to go through all sorts of cultural experience. They, they emphasize the cultural experiences. You get to have a sense 
of what the Hakka culture is about. So those those are the kinds of hotels I I like to recommend people go. To. Well, I gotta I gotta check them out next time I'm I'm in those places if I ever right. get to go back, which I hope I do. Um, so which travel which credit card do you use when you travel? Uh, I use a Visa card, and it's a Visa card from Citibank that I get because I'm a member of Costco. <laughs> And, and I do, uh, you know, I, for many years, I had a, a credit card I used that uh, gave me miles. Uh, and, and then I started to notice that the miles that they were asking for to use them were really increasing uh, much worse than if I had United or, or American or one of the other cards, which I do have. Uh, but uh, the Costco gives you money. <laughs> yeah, and I've I, seen it. I like, I, so depending on what you purchase, you end up ending up with a check that you can use for your next trip. So, uh, so I started using uh, the Citibank card that I got through my Costco membership. Right. And recently I changed over. And you know, another thing I, I want to say this, I'm not going to want to slam anybody, but I do want to say that another value of what's gone on with this pandemic is we have really gotten to see from the companies and the, the businesses that we use, which ones have stepped up. Which ones have stepped up to take care of their customers? Which ones, like United Airlines, uh, if they cancel the flight, you are able to get your uh, get a refund back from them? Not well, the, it wasn't like that with United in the beginning. No, it wasn't. It is. It has been now. You're right. Yes. Some of some of them have not. They've gotten either. They've gotten hip to it or they got the idea that well, they better do this because they want these customers to come back to them when things are well. Well, United's I, one of my sponsors, and I, and I hate to throw them under the bus, but they were one of the worst when it came to refunds. Really? Um, they, were, well, they, they, they changed. They did change. Um, they changed. If, but, you know, there were very, very strict restrictions. You had to have purchased your ticket at one time, talking about my trip to, to France. And then if only if they canceled the flight. They had to cancel the flight. You, you couldn't say, you couldn't call up and say, I can't go. Wait a minute, the EU won't let me in. I can't use these tickets, which right. is what I said to the guy from Avis. And he said, too bad, there's still a cancellation fee. Right. You know? So I'm sorry to- No, I, 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 this is one thing that I am very passionate about. And I, you know, I would give United the hardest time um, because I just thought it was wrong. And they actually tried to change their rules in their contract of carriage. Usually if your flight's delayed two hours or more, you can then get a full refund. They yeah. changed it at one time during this pandemic to 25 hours, which is oh, ridiculous. Yeah. So they, they, they got, that's what they told me is because it was two hours or more, you could get your money back. So yeah, they, they changed it back after they went to six hours and then they've finally gone back to two hours now. So they have, they have caught on because they got so much heat. Yeah. But, um, well, that's the solution. The solution is, if you don't say something about the way you're being treated, then you can expect that some companies particularly will take advantage of that situation. You have to, as a traveler, you have to speak up and say, that is wrong. And I, I did it with Avis, I did it with Ryanair. Ryanair was the worst. I was gonna say, good luck with that one. Yeah, yeah, and I fortunately, uh, well, the way I did it, is my credit card at, that, that I was using, which was, was Capital One, I had to complain to Capital One. I said, I never got the services and um, they, they, they canceled the flights. Yep. I never got the services and they want to give me a voucher. I'm not going to be using a voucher for Ryanair because that was part of my trip to go cover a St. Patrick's Day in Ireland and I'm not covering that. So, um, so, and I had to get Capital One, one of the reasons, by the way, I'm using Citibank Costco card is because of how I was treated by Capital One around this. Did they get, so did you do a chargeback and they give you your I money back? Chargeback and they came back and refused the chargeback. Mm -hmm. And I said, and I said, what are you talking about? You know, we, we talked about that. I said, why would you do that? Uh, Ryan here said they were going to refund the ticket. <laughs> now you're not agree. You're not helping. You're not supporting your customer. Right. And uh, we had a very long conversation with one of their supervisors. Eventually, they relented, but Ryanair never did. Right. They relented and charged Ryanair and gave me a credit uh, for that person. Yeah, and it, it's I do these things, you know, I don't care. It, we're the customer. 
it's important that the traveling public complain about when they're treated badly. Agree. You're not going to get treated better by not saying something about it. This is what I write about on my website every yep. day. And, You're absolutely uh, totally right. And that would be johnnyjet.com, right? <laughs> it is. Thanks for the plug. So again, real quick for anyone listening, you know, if an airline does play tricks with you like Ryanair has and United did in the beginning, you know, you just keep escalating it, try to get to a supervisor. If they say no, then you call your credit card company and you ask for a charge back and hopefully your credit card company will do that. Usually you want to do it within 60 days, but, um, yeah, you know. there is a, don't worry. There are major time limits and everybody's looking for an out. So you have to be sure you got to be uh, really up on it and you have to hit all those deadlines, get them, get them all the information they knew. And then if they choose to not understand who their customer is, then it's time to look for another credit card. Yes. Right. Um, we got sidetracked a little bit and I only got about 10 minutes left and I got okay. about 10 questions. So we're going to do a speed okay. round kind of speed round. Uh, what's your favorite Island? Cuba. Okay. I thought you were going to say Cuba. Taiwan. Undiscovered Island. Taiwan would be second. Undiscovered Island. A lot to offer. Someday Americans are going to be able to travel. I am mourn in mourning for all of my American travelers who can no longer travel individually around the country. All the airlines were pulled back and they can only fly now. American Airlines can only fly directly in Havana when they were flying to the other parts of the island. There, this is the largest island in the Caribbean, most friendly people in the world, and the most beautiful scenery. You don't go to Cuba somehow, some way, then you're missing out. Yeah, I mean, actually, we can quickly touch upon this. I mean, you know, as someone who is who grew up in South Florida and it was Cuban ancestry. Right. I mean, I know in Florida, it seems like it's half and half that people think that Cuba should be opened up and the other half says, no, we should not. And I'm one of those that think it should be opened up. Absolutely. I mean, come on. We were, we were, we were promised in the Constitution that we had certainly unalienable rights. And among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's having the freedom to travel is not the pursuit of happiness, then nothing is. And how can they allow us to travel to China, which in my opinion is kind of like the evil empire, and we can't travel to Cuba, an island 90 miles off our shore, because they're communist. Chinese are communists too. Uh, I mean, this is a really a grudge match between the historically uh, uh, conservative, uh, Cuban population in Miami that came to Miami after uh, Castro took power in, uh, in the 1960s. Uh, many of them connected to the former dictator and, uh, and also to escape from communism. They had a right to do that. And that is what is, uh, 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 unfortunately, this is a political decision. It's not based in any kind of fact. The only people that get hurt is Americans who want to travel to Cuba and should. And Cubans, of course, this is a, the only people being punished are the Cubans. Well, Not it seems like the down. younger population definitely thinks it should be opened up. So I think it's only a matter of time before we go back to what Obama did. Absolutely, the pursuit of the pursuit of happiness. We have a right, an alienable right, to the pursuit of happiness. Travel is part of that. As you know, I end up every quote with a quote from Mark Twain that travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. We need to go to Cuba, not only to change those people's mind about our country, but to change, I mean, to change our mind about the, those people, but to change those people's mind about us. There's the value. That's the two-way street. We get to change. They're living in the same prejudice and misconceptions about Americans until they get to meet them. Right. That's I our mean, job. To I've experienced that all around the world where I've, you know, I'm meeting people and having dinner like, wow, I never knew an American could be so cool or smart or, and I'm like, well, I'm not that smart, but, uh, but they're just their image of You're us. You're an ambassador. You're an ambassador, yeah. American ambassador. We, every traveler who leaves this country is an ambassador for America. And I agree. to, to I agree restrict that. that travel, to restrict that travel is a crime. Yep. Uh, I'm with you. Okay, how about what's your favorite travel movie or movie that inspired you to travel? Uh, that would be Lost in America with Albert Brooks. Have you ever seen that movie? I don't think so. Oh, you have to. That is one of the 
best travel movies and funniest movies. I love Albert Brooks, yeah, but he's uh, it's an old movie, uh, Lost in America. How about uh, how about TV travel show besides travel, Joseph Rosendo's Travel Scope? Yes, well, I'm glad you said besides. Uh, well, I, I love McKellar's show, Bare Feet. I think that's a, that's a fabulous show. Uh, Julie, there's a new show on PBS called Canvassing the World, and Julie is the executive producer. So I have to, and that's a, a really fine show, uh, uh, very interesting take on travel from an artist's perspective. Um, and and you, that's, that's a show, just their first season. This is their first season. They're in production for their second season. And they were smart enough to uh, hire Julie as their executive producer. You know what? I gotta get. I gotta hire her as mine. Yeah, um, she's fantastic. How about a favorite travel book? A favorite travel book. Uh, well, Mark Twain. Besides uh, *Innocence Abroad* by Mark Twain is a fabulous book. You know, and you know how uh, enamored I am of him and his uh, attitude towards travel. Another great book that I love for people who have traveled to India, it's really useful for people who have traveled to India. It's called an Indian, it's called Holy Cow, an Indian Adventure. It's a really wonderful, wonderful book. Uh, and of course, there's this book called Musings to Short Happy Pursuit of uh, Pleasure and Other Journeys. I would recommend that one too. <laughs> people can find out about that one by going to my website, which is travelscope.net. Gotcha. And do you Sorry, everybody. Sorry. <laughs> and do you, do you subscribe to any travel newsletters or follow certain people um, that you like that you get news from or, you know, get inspiration from? On, uh, on for travel? Um, you know, I, I really uh, try to, uh, there are a number, it's, it's overwhelming amount. I can't, I can't really signal one out that I go to for, for uh, travel. I go to your website johnnyjet.com and I get information there. It's completely packed. I'm, I was amazed. I'm amazed how much information you get there. I always say, where does this guy get the time to do all this stuff? It's <laughs> amazing. People have to go to your website, johnnyjet.com and, and, and find out uh, and use the information. And those, that's a, that's a good, good, uh, you give them good information and it's backed and you, and I, I, agree with you and your philosophy of travel. So it's kind of the thing I would recommend them to. Well, that's very nice. Thank Generally, you. Generally, but there's also, you know, there's wonderful magazines that would far, travel guides. My favorite travel guides would be uh, Rough Guides and, um, and Lonely Planet. They're both really good. And I have to mention DK Eyewitness Travel Guides. The most beautiful guidebooks in the world are made by DK Eyewitness. Uh, Eyewitness. Uh, not to mention the fact that they were under our underwriter for five years. So they have they were pretty smart people to do that and get us off and running. Four, four or five questions. You ready? Yeah. Uh, real quick. Worst travel moment. Worst travel moment. Uh, worst travel moment. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have any worst travel moments. That's good. Never since. robbed? Never robbed? I was never. Uh, yeah, I was. I was robbed in Ar Arles. I was on a bike. Probably my fault. I didn't have it. Keep it secure. I had my backpack. Uh, strapped onto the back of the of the of the bike, and uh, before I knew it, I turned around. I stopped at a light. I turned around. And someone had taken that my strap off and it, and had taken the backpack. Well, and so I lost. And this is in France. This was in Arles, France. Okay. Unfortunately, it's the only problem I've ever had. Uh, you know the, the only. So they they slashed it, and you didn't feel it. No, they they actually un, 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 it was it was so badly put on there that it was very easy to just. Oh, it was on the bike. It wasn't on your back. Gotcha. You know, it wasn't on my back. It was on my on gotcha. the back of the bike, oh, uh, where you know normally somebody would sit, for instance. Or you would put you would put a backpack if you were in a country, but in the middle of Arles, where you have people who are suffering and not as, as a poor section of town, and I'm driving around like you know oblivious. Yep, I got uh, it was, that was a bad one, but mm -hmm. that's the only time really that that's happened. That's good. I've had embarrassing moments where I got locked out of a cabin in a, in a, on a cruise ship completely naked. I have that one. <laughs> Let's hear that one because I was about to ask you what's your most embarrassing. Oh, I was packing up and I, had, I was, you know, I was completely, I came out of the shower and I'm packing up and I picked the bag up because they told me you had to leave the bag outside. And I, I took the bag out and walked outside the door locked on me. <laughs> Where I was caught cowering in the corners, Great. calling the front to have somebody come and open the door for me. Because I, I was naked, so I didn't have the key. That has almost happened to me. 
Because um, yeah, those doors slam so quickly. quickly. I, could, I, I heard you go, and I thought, ah! It was interesting. It was a funny experience. I've always worried about that, honestly. Uh, that's funny. Um, what's your dream destination? Well, I, you know, I've never been to New Zealand. I would like to, I want to go to New Zealand. I want to move to New Zealand. Huh? I want to move to New Zealand after this pandemic. Yeah, I know. A lot of people do. A lot of people do. Yeah. And uh, I could see, uh, I would, I would, I would, that's my dream to, to go over there. And, and Antarctica, of course, I'd like to have that adventure experience. I've had some wonderful experiences uh, and, and that would be one. And I want to, I, I'd like to get to know more of, of South America and more of Africa. I've had the opportunities to travel in both continents and have great experiences there. And I know a, little, a bit of it. And all the experiences have been amazing. I, I want to. I want to know more of them, both those continents. I'm with you. How about um, what? I have a feeling I know the answer to this, but what has travel taught you? Well, yeah, travel taught me that uh, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. <laughs> travel has taught me that the world is wonderful, as opposed to what you might read in the newspapers. And and people are wonderful. And 99.9% of people in the world are there, are like you. Uh, they may have other beliefs, they may have different colors, they may have uh, different uh, customs, but that is the thrill of traveling, is to incorporate. I like to say that when we travel, we should travel to be augmented, to become back larger than uh, we are when we left. And I don't mean five pounds larger from eating French pastry, although that happens too. I mean, psychologically, inspirationally, uh, uh, in our souls, we should come back better and bigger people than we left. And that's why Mark Twain's quote is so important to him. And, and there's another half to that quote where he says that, and this is something that is badly needed in our country. No one in the world, no one becomes uh, open hearted, op a welcoming person by spending their life in a small corner of the world that's the, the second half of that there it, it's not word by word that's paraphrased that's the second half of that quote but um yeah but that's that that's what that's you know, that, that's what i'm going to post that about. i'm going to post that quote today on my yeah. on my social media because oh, it's it's post so, the whole quote post it's, the rest, the rest. i always use just the first half the rest of the rest of it even as more uh specific to people from the United States. For sure. Especially these times. I mean, I, I was the same way. I used to, I was afraid to leave the United States. I didn't leave the United States until I was 20, 23. Yeah, same, same year I did. And, and I, was, I went because I was an actor and I got this job. You know, my father once told me, and, and I'm sorry, I have to reveal this about him. I told him I was going to Europe. And he said, I've, I'm, I'm not, I've not lost anything in Europe. That was his response to, and I think that's the response of a lot of people. Why do I want to go to Europe? I, I, I didn't lose something there. No. I have no reason to go. The reason you go, and I told him, was because you'll come back a better Joe, and his name was Joe, <laughs> you'll come back a better Joe than you are today. Yeah. And, you know, and, and he was a, a good hearted man, but he didn't get it. He didn't get what a foreign place where he would be uncomfortable would get it. Why being uncomfortable would be positive. Right. Being uncomfortable is very important. We need to travel in places. Uh, another quote I know is that we need to travel in places where people's concept of time is different than us. Concept of time is different than ours. It's true. You go to France, different. people are just relaxing, having a, a you know, while Americans, you know, if they go to a cafe, they, they spend 10 minutes instead of, you know, a couple hours. Yeah, people get upset because uh, the French take two hours for lunch. Yeah. Well, the French aren't upset, uh, you know, <laughs> about it. They're, they're not there to serve you. Right. We say, well, why, why isn't, we're on, we're on, we're on the, the Canal de Midi, stopped in a village, and the place was closed for four hours, this, this bike shop. They're there to rent bikes to me, and they shut down. <laughs> why? Because that's not important to them. Yeah. What's important to them is the joie de vivre, the joy of life. Right. They understand it's not being behind a desk renting you a, bi a, mode, a bicycle yeah one of my travel tips is to you know if you're really hungry you know or don't go to a restaurant in europe when you're really hungry you better go you know well in advance before your tum your tummy starts uh, rumbling right. don't but, rush anybody don't rush anybody in a french restaurant unless you want to lose your head yeah 
the point. chef may be coming after you with a cleaver. Yeah, I, I've had experiences like that. I, in fact, one of them, uh, the uh, 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 iconic one, is in my book. Uh, okay. it's, and I went on on a trip, and I I thought I had to have this experience. I ran into a place and had a quick meal. And these people, at least, were were nice and generous to me. Because it was insulting for me to think I could sit down in a French restaurant and be out of there in a half an hour. No way ever is that possible. Um, my last question, and unfortunately, I got to cut this a little bit. It's not short. This is actually going to be my longest interview, which I'm actually, you know, very happy because I, I love talking to you. And um, well, thank you, John. And I, um, I find it really interesting. I'm sorry, I wasn't. That's okay. I just I know my wife's upstairs going. Man, what's going on? I I, I got to go. Um, <laughs> But my last question is, what's your best travel tip? My best travel tip is to go, go with the flow. Uh, go with the flow. Don't, don't sweat the small stuff. Expect that there will be hiccups. But sometimes those become the best experience. I've had many things that I didn't plan to happen. Not all of them wonderful. And yet, I, there are some of my dearest memories are, these, are dealing with these experiences, these hiccups. Yeah, go with the flow, celebrate the moment. And these days, I have been telling people to stay safe, be wise, and fear not. That's, that would be my, hope that did that. Joseph, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, it really was a pleasure uh, talking to you, and I can't wait to see you in person. Yeah, that'll be soon. It will be out there. We'll, we'll, we'll. We're waiting. We're, we're chomping at the bit. We'll all be out there soon. I hope so. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. I really appreciate it. Love, love your website and all the stuff that you do. Thank, well, you, so thank you. Thank you. And good luck and best to Julie. Happy traveling. You do.